We're back for the final part of our visit to Rustville 2024, put on by Ian and Carly from Hubnut, Matt from Furious Driving, and Steph from iDriver Classic at the British Motor Museum. Two more examples of the Citroen GS here, the newer model, a hatchback next to the older estate with a smaller, one-litre flat four. Now the best I can tell, this is based on a Ford Transit, but beyond some basic engine information, I have no idea. Enlighten us all in the comments if you know more about this. This Skoda made a trek across Europe this summer, and at Rustville you could donate to doodle on the car. You can see how their journey went on the Dash to Dubrovnik rally over on Instagram at at check on a trek, and donate to their cause at the Just Giving link on their page. An original style Mini will always look small in any car parking space, and this Mark V, which was the last iteration fitted with the smaller 998cc engine, just looks dwarfed parked up next to this absolute behemoth, the Ford Galaxy 500. Same number of doors and seats, but more than six times the displacement and 5.4 meters in length against barely over three meters for the Mini. The Cordia was a short-lived model, only in production eight years before the Eclipse took over after a short hiatus, swapping one extreme for the other and smoothing out all of those body lines. And from one white hot hatch we moved to another, and then on down past a facelift Mark III Vauxhall Cavalier and a second gen BMW Mini to something quite different. This is a Skoda Bugrat, and is built from a kit from a company called RV Dynamics, which uses the underpinnings from a Skoda Rapid, which was one of the last rear-engine Skodas, and produced between 1984 and 1990 as a two-door coupe. Hello, uh, welcome to Pedalbox. Uh, weld, frown, grind and repeat. Fun is better than good. I've read that off this bloke's t-shirt. Um, my name's John Coopman from John Coopman Cars and uh, I'm here with my Rover 75 at the Rustable Festival here for 2024. Some of you may have seen it on my YouTube channel. If you have, I'm genuinely humbled because you're all absolute legends for watching. Thank you very much. You can see in the background there the, um, the absolute legend that is Dad, who keeps it on the road, is, is his here as well. And he's actually been getting swamped with visitors genuinely. That's not an not over-exaggeration either. It's the first Rustival, as we all know. I've had a great day today. And I've had so many people here, here with uh, talking about my Rover 75. If you haven't watched my channel, and this is a senseless plug, please do. Uh, but long story short, I bought this Rover 75 uh, three, three or four months ago now, um, and I kind of let my heart rule my head. Dad used to work for a Rover dealership. Me growing up, Dad brought one of these home from the launch, and I saw it and absolutely fell in love with it and thought, wow, look at that. What is that? I thought, it, could it be a Rolls-Royce? Could it be a Bentley? No, it was the humble Rover 75 in Wedgwood Blue, in this spec. Actually, that's a lie. It had uh, the Connoisseur um, chrome caps on the wing mirrors. So I bought this just before Christmas, 50-odd thousand miles on the clock. Cowley car, uh, one owner, ironically, a Mr. Cowley. Um, and it had a few more problems than I thought. I'm not mechanically minded. I took one look at it and went, ah, that's beautiful and pretty and cheap, and I want it. So me and Dad have spent the last three months getting it fixed. So if you haven't been watching the channel, let me tell you about a few of the issues we faced with the Rover 75, because like I say, I bought it and thought it was brilliant, and actually, mm -mm. yes, it has the K-Series engine. Yes, the head gasket failed. Talk about that in just a moment. So I got the car. I bought it, I brought it back from Preston, and the temperature gauge was doing this and this and this. Got home and there was no water left in the tank. Dad took a look, he said, well, we will have to do a uh, cylinder leakage test to make sure that it is the head gasket that's failed. We did a cylinder leakage test, and it came back with negative. The head gasket hadn't failed. So lots of other things that we did, um, there was evidence, shall we say, that somebody under the bonnet had previously been trying to solve a coolant issue, new radiator, new water pump, new pipes, and uh, in the end that actually turned out to be a multitude of different things, including new thermostat that needed to be replaced. The heater matrix was totally blocked, and um, it needed 
uh, some work underneath there for the expansion cap because it got the original expansion cap on the car, which had, had failed. So we got that sorted, and then Dad decided to start poking around in the sills, and we found a couple of holes, didn't we? So we've had to put a whole new sill on it as well. I say we, Dad again. Um, we got some tin. <laughs> we bought from a reputable Amazon supplier a sill. It was no good. Um, however, Dad managed to fabricate something in the end, weld it to the car, and hopefully you're not able to see now where the uh, repair has been. Um, thankfully, our saving grace is it's a Cowley car. It's an early car, 2000, so it's got black sills. So satin black, tss, winner, winner. Um, we took it out for our first test drive. Hooray, we're coming to the Rustival. Mm -mm, no, the head gasket failed on our 20 mile journey. So we've then had to replace the head gasket and do a mini engine rebuild, including new uh, valves lapped in and uh, stem seals, etc., etc. Sort of a, a top rebuild, cylinder head rebuild. So far, touch wood, it's going well. We've made it to the Rustival 2024. It was about 120 miles here, and we actually used the onboard diagnostics to tell us the actual live engine temperature and we, we watched it all the way here and it didn't go critical. So thankfully, it's here. Uh, thanks to the team at Pedalox for giving the, me the opportunity to have a chat with you guys today. If you haven't seen the videos on the channel, uh, again, senseless plug for my channel, but you can watch them at www.youtube.com slash John Coupland. That's J-O-N-C-O-U-P-L-A-N-D. If you search for Rover 75 and Lincolnshire, you will probably find us. Have a great day. Thanks to all for watching us. Keep watching Pedalbox. If you haven't subscribed to them, please do. If you haven't subscribed to me, please do. Thanks for watching. Back into the show with this very early Aquamarine Corsa Merit, which was first sold only five months after the model was introduced. The color was reserved for both the Merit and LS models and even has a matching Nokia 3310 on the dashboard. Now it's always nice when a car stays in the family, and this Gilburn Invader has been passed down after standing in a garage for 18 years. It went back on the road as a rolling restoration project with tons of history and memories on display. Not a common car to see, given there are only 573 Invaders left on the road as of recording. And not far down from the Corsa is another super clean aquamarine paint job, this time draped over some immaculate Swedish steel. The white walls might not be to everyone's taste, but they do set off the super clean original wheels. Trabants have a reputation of being extremely slow, but I'd wager this one is a little bit quicker, thanks to a pretty hefty electric motor replacing the original 600cc inline two. The death trap sticker feels pretty accurate, but I'm willing to bet this is a hoot to drive. Another little and large pairing between a 3.5 meter Citroen AX and a 5.6 meter Lincoln Continental two door, apparently called Honest Abe. Packing about the biggest engine here at 7.6 litres or 462 cubic inches. It's so American, the current owner even bought it on the 4th of July, and you can see more of it over on the HSG Automotive channel. The Ferrari Mondial is oft overlooked, and even derided as the worst Ferrari, due to comparisons with the 308 and the 328, but it's still a Ferrari V8, and it's no slouch. This car is featured in the Autopian, owned by their writer, Adrian Clark, and proudly shows off a membership badge. Given the choice of no Ferrari or a Mondial, I'm pretty sure I'd choose the Mondial any day of the week. Maybe until the servicing bill arrives, anyway. And now the needle swings back the other way from delicate sports car to wafty luxury with a Plymouth Fury. When chrome and fins were the order of the day, maybe keep clear of any two-door red ones from 1958, though. There were quite a few miners at the show, but I think this was the only tour I saw on the day. One thing I didn't realise was the soft top was one of the original body styles with the coupe, with the four-door arriving a couple of years later. And another one of the more recent attendees is this 2022 Lotus Exige, which apparently shares an engine block with the Toyota Camry found in the US. Next to it, the only Citroen BX estate I saw all day, like many others sitting high on its hydropneumatic suspension. Starting with this Rover 100, there was a long row of marks which would eventually fall under British Leyland. Next to the Rover, another Austin 7 sat alongside a pair of Triumphs. 
The Triumph 2000 and the 2.5 PI are essentially the same car, with a 2 litre and a 2.5 litre inline 6 respectively, though the PI denotes petrol injection rather than the 2000's carb. Finally, a very late registered Triumph Toledo, which went out of production in 1976, and a Morris 1100. To the other side of that Rover, there were two Peugeot 504s, one estate and one saloon with 2.3 and 2 litre engines respectively. The Chevrolet Corvair was a somewhat unique vehicle in the US for being a domestically made car with a rear-mounted flat engine with a turbo, and until today, I didn't even realise they used the platform to make a van. There were also a couple of Reliants in this area too. First up is this Rialto, which was the successor to the Robin and debuted in 1982. The Rialto SE, launched in 86, the same year as this Rialto 2 was made, featured a hatchback instead of an estate rear after further work was done to the roof to strengthen it for hinges. Finally, this is, or perhaps was, a Reliant Super Robin, but stripped back to the bare chassis with a very basic body attached to enclosed driver and passenger. The whole steering mechanism is exposed, complete with suspension, brakes and engine, with just a meagre mudguard and bonnet. Why might someone do this? Well, this is an extremely competent rally and trials event vehicle, which, judging by the mud, is where this one's been. This isn't your autosport flat on tarmac course, more up the side of a hill you'd probably try not to climb on foot, let alone try to drive up under normal circumstances. They're light, reliable and have great ground clearance, at least when you've stripped the body off like this one. Once again, thanks to everybody who's watched these extremely delayed videos from Rustaval. They took a lot longer to produce than I expected. Thanks to Ian, Carly, Matt and Steph for putting the event on. Check out all the links to all of the channels mentioned in the description. And subscribe to Pedalbox if you'd like to see more of this, or us working on our own cars, and hopefully attending some events with them in the future. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.